All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the October 7th workshop for the Greenville City Council. I'll be, I'm here, PJ Conley, for presiding over today's workshop. First, I'll call our city clerk for the roll call. Yes, sir. Mayor Connolly. Here. Mayor Tim Daniels. Council Member Foreman. Mayor Tim Daniels. Council Member Blackburn. Present. Council Member Sully, let us know that you will not be attending this evening. Council Member Robinson. Present. You always get more with us. <laughs> Councilmember Willis. Here. All right, Mayor Conley, you have a floor. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the approval of the agenda. Mr. Manager? No changes. Do I have a motion to approve? Second. All right, motion has been made by Councilmember Blackburn, second by Councilmember Willis. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Let's move on to item number one. All right, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Mayor. Thank you. Mayor. Thank you. Business is the National Opioid Fund mm -hmm. Settlement Update. I'll call forward our Neighborhood Business Services Program Manager, Renee Skeen, for the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, so we'll start out a uh, partnership with Pitt County to maximize the impact of the opioid settlement funds by collaborating. Uh, we can better address the opioid crisis through coordinated efforts across both the city and the county. All right, so we'll give you a little background. Um, in 2021, the City of Greenville initially signed onto the N National Opioid Settlement Fund Memorandum of Agreement with the North Carolina Department of Justice. The settlement fund provides funding to the city for up to 18 years, totaling about $1.89 million. Uh, Pitt County's funding will total about $15.9 million. Uh, many allowable uses for the funds are including but not limited to recovery support services, recovery support housing, prevention, training, and nil laxone. I didn't get my pharmacy degree, but I'm getting there. <laughs> Distribution. Active collaboration with Pitt County regarding the use of funds to help with the opioid epidemic. <clears throat> Current efforts to address the opioid crisis, the county is actively working with partners to provide allowable initiatives including Narcan distribution to first responders in the community, the needle exchange program to prevent disease transmission, fentanyl awareness programs, and the medication assisted treatment, peer recovery support, and diversion programs to redirect individuals to treatment rather than incarceration. Okay. The city of Greenville's role in maximizing the impact to date, the city has received a little over $500,000 of its total settlement allocation, which is now avail available for immediate use. We propose allocating these funds as well as future installments to Pitt County. This approach ensures maximum efficiency and regional impact by leveraging Pitt County's existing programs and services. By doing so, we benefit from expanded recovery services across the county, ensuring the Greenville residents have access to comprehensive care. All right, benefits of partnering, partnering with Pitt County. They have increased opportunity for regional impact by addressing opioid challenges across Greenville and Pitt County. They have access to expanded recovery services, ensuring all residents benefit from comprehensive care and they have the ability to leverage existing programs to ensure immediate and future growth and implement new programs based on increased capacity. Efficiency and transparent management of the programs and services, settlement funds and compliance through a dedicated position, the opioid settlement coordinator. Uh, this will avoid duplication of efforts, including use of city staff capacity to develop and implement programs in existence. Uh, there are many other jurisdictions in North Carolina, including Cary, Charlotte, Concord, Raleigh, that have recognized the benefits of similar collaborations. So we believe Greenville will be greatly benefit from the partnership as well. So our proposed next steps, the city will present a plan to allocate all current and future opioid settlement funds to the county and the city and county will maintain an ongoing partnership to help coordinate efforts, including on October the 4th, the city and county hosted a stakeholders meeting. Uh, they'll have participation in future selection of programs and service providers, hosting community meetings to gather community feedback, 
Uh, the specific ask will be to evaluate the need and ability to provide transitional housing, implementation of single portal enter entry process. So let's continue to partner for a healthier and more resilient community. Uh, the staff recommendations. Staff recommends for the City Council to evaluate the information for discussion on the proposed next steps, including potential for allocating all current and future opioid settlement funds to Pitt County. We also plan to bring this back to Council in November for adoption and proposal. Any questions? Oh, and also want to take the moment to um, introduce Caitlin uh, Houston. She is the opioid settlement coordinator for Pitt County. And then we also have here today Angie Manning. She is our deputy, not ours, but deputy director for uh, the health department. Thank you for being here. What were your names again? I'm sorry. Caitlin Houston. Okay. And Angela Manning. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Sure. I was curious about if we will be able to have um, periodic updates on how um, things are going with the uh, community partners. Um, I know that you guys will come back before us and well, we'll get more information in November, um, but I would love to have these kept in the loop and updated periodically about how um, we're disseminating funds and how community partners are supporting the efforts. So, um, yes, so we will absolutely give you um, as much information as you want mm -hmm. or don't want. Um, so we regularly, um, so we're in the process of um, developing kind of who wants to know, how often they want to know. Um, we regularly are in the plan to report to our board of health. And that's who, that's our board that we directly report to. And then, of course, we also would be responsible for reporting to the Board of Commissioners um, as often as our county and Georgina's um, Gallagher would want us to as well. Um, so certainly, um, we will work with you to, if your desire for reporting, how often you would want to. Um, we are working um, feverishly to, we are um, numbers kind of people, Caitlin and I kind of have that desire. Um, and so we actually want to share um, the good work that these organizations are doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so we really want to put together a shared platform for all of the organizations that are doing and be able to have that um, on a regular, every day that you could go to at any point in time on a web page um, mm -hmm. and but also be able to pull that up and ensure that information on a regular basis. So absolutely. And Council Member uh, Wells, I would echo that. Mm -hmm. We will continually provide information through um, workshops like this or council presentations about the progress that we're making collaboratively between the city and the county with Caitlin and her efforts and as well as the stakeholders and in the formulation of what of the plan mm -hmm. and then the rollout of the plan and then the progress with the plan so this is a, <coughs> this is a collaboration that we're looking at where we can both come together both to the county commissioners mm -hmm. the health department as well as the city council to making sure that we're doing everything we can to put those one-time opportunities to the best that best with our community Awesome, because yes. that's fifteen million dollars over about eighteen years. Eighteen years. years. Okay. Exactly. Awesome. 18 years. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we do want to put this in perspective because people have heard it's fifteen million dollars. We don't have all fifteen million dollars right now. We have the county has received year to date three point nine. Um, at the end of this year, it'll be we're supposed to get four point two, but it's kind of like my personal bank account. My husband won't let me spend money for get it. Um, so <laughs> we, we do have. Man, uh, <laughs> so we do have um, to kind of put that in perspective in trying to budget what we can grant and what we can <clears throat> allocate to the programs. Putting that in perspective, um, you know, we've had some large ask. It would be great if we could do a five million dollar grant. Great, but when we're we only have 3.9 in the bank right now. But overall, it is supposed to be 15 to allocate to the county, um, and then your allocation is that 500,000 right now. And then I think your allocation is 1.8 over the 15, 18 years, 18 years. Um, as well. So the time period is 18 years. As we get closer to 18 years, your allocation per year gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so we kind of got big chunks up front. There are new settlement partners that are going to be added, that have been added. 
Um, but then there's also been new settlement partners or old settlement partners that have settled and have paid out up front, and so you're not getting that year-to-year um, second. So there is some fluctuations in the funding. I have a couple of questions. Number one, who does who decides which grants get honored and how much? Okay, so that is a great question. And so that is something that we really want to do a fair and transparent process in. And so what we are proposing and what we are talking with our administrative staff in um, is really taking a, having the approach of a review committee. Um, now we are not inventing this wheel. I'm all about, if somebody's already done this work, kind of taking the battles and the lessons they've learned. We would like to have an informed review committee, people that are citizens, that have, um, such as representatives of the community. Um, we would like to have a representative from city um, on this review committee, maybe about seven people to review the applications. Um, our application process, we wanna make as transparent as possible. The regulations associated with this money while this is a private settlement, it is kind of public money. It's very complicated. And my philosophy is the complication should be for me and Caitlin and the legal to figure out. It should not be complicated for this, the um, grantees you want to apply for the money. Um, so we want a transparent process. We want a review committee to review the applications and then they make the um, recommendations to the board of commissioners who ultimately have the legal authority to grant the money to award. We would like to do an intent, a letter of intent application um, just because the um, names of this money are so stipulative that, um, so if you tell me, hey, I wanna go buy a bus and I wanna go transport people around. Well, not all of that is feasible. And this is money you do not get a check up front. This is a reimbursement process. If you're applying for $50,000, got to be able to have that $50,000 up front to be able to fund your organization. Um, so we do have that kind of process. We want a transparent process. So we are proposing a review committee, um, and we are, it's a multidisciplinary review committee. Um, and so it's not a Caitlin Society, Angie Manning Society. It would be a review committee. And just to note that these dollars will fall under the, the guidance of what we call the senior law State and, federal federal, state and federal allocations to both the city and the county. So this will be uh, subject uh, to audit scrutiny every mm -hmm. single year to make sure yes. that both the city and the county have collectively utilized the fundings and um, in conjunction with all the, the, yes. the, the statutes and the rules out there uh, that oversee it. And spending. all the expenses that an awardee has proposed and spent and been reimbursed for are um, opioid funding can only be used for 100% opioid consumption, usage, and time. Um, so anything bought with opioid funding can only be used for opioid use. Um, I have a couple of questions, and I appreciate <coughs> Councilmember Robinson's question about the grants. Mm -hmm. um, my first question is, these are reimbursements only. I, is, was that set by the in terms of the, the settlement of the lawsuits? And it was it was a process so when um, when the county got their money, um, the county started working with um, grantees prior to really instructions from the DOJ and the OSAC committee. Um, we have come a long way with that. And so with it being a reimbursement process, it keeps us safe from a legal an audit process so that if you have spent money on an unallowable expense, then we are protected. So it's a local requirement that it's reimbursement. Yes, us. that is how we have set up the structure. And my, my, my concern is, and this is just, you know, from somebody on the yes. outside, often that it seems to me that that's going to put organizations who are already well off in a much better position versus organizations that may be new, that may be directly working with uh, uh, folks, you know, in the community, these organizations, you know, may not have deep pockets. What we have actually found is a little bit of the opposite, and I'll tell you why. Organizations that are smaller and um, they have an easier time with the reporting mechanism. In other words, I'll use the county, for example, in Caitlin. Okay, so Caitlin's 100% opioid. However, 
if Caitlin, let's say, was a health educator, and let's say she's 50% opioid and 50% another health department program, I've got to somehow show her time in our time system, which is the machine outside of my control, <coughs> and break down her hours, her 40-hour work week, of what was opioid and what was not, and then her time sheet from an audit perspective to be able to show the auditors and the OSAT and the DOJ that let's say $500 was true opioid work. So sometimes what you find in organizations that already have a lot of structure and everything like that, they have a harder time breaking down those expenses to show Yeah, and I this was mostly just thinking, you know, that's, so, that's a great explanation. What I was thinking about is newer, yes. smaller organizations that may not, that may have a very ambitious idea, yes. but they don't have that million dollars right. to put forth immediately. To be reimbursed yes, on. and that's where that letter of intent comes in, and that's where our transparency comes in to, to say, do you have the funding too? And with us, we are trying to do a very streamlined reimbursement process. So that is where them putting together a very streamlined budget, we have very streamlined forms for reimbursement so that they can get their reimbursements fairly quickly. The organizations, and that's something that in our survey that we recently did, our stakeholders meeting, that was one of the survey questions because we want to know what is working and what's not working. Thank you. And then my next question is really just kind of a general question. I think, Michael, you kind of answered, which is the reason that it's, we're, we're kind of putting it all into one pot with the county because they they have social services and health department. Right. It's more fitting for them to That's have right. it. So that we're not recreating the wheel on top of each other. Okay. Okay. Because right. I know the city doesn't really do much social work. No, I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got an old saying. Get out of here, Molly. <laughs> <laughs> I've got an old saying. That's that 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 your that fish anymore, though, is it? <laughs> Those that have been around me enough know they get tired of hearing it, but you can be a jack of all trades and a master of none. Yeah. And you want to put your efficiencies in the place where you can you can gain the most efficiency. Okay, that makes really good sense. Thank you. I do have another a question. So you stated that um, it'll be seven people on the review committee estimated that is, right that now. That is what we are proposing and planning. So that, that's still in the planning phases and everything like that. So we okay. that is. That is what we are brainchilding to formulate and everything like that. So it could be nine, could be, you know. Okay. Love. Yeah. And, 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 love. <laughs> right. 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 I just want to, so one of those seats is guaranteed we, for the city. We, because we do want y'all to have input. And, oh, and so, yeah, yeah. We, mm -hmm. we have been working with your city staff members now for well, three, four months. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it has been nothing but a positive joy. And so, um, I mean, hopefully it will continue that way. It will. And so, um, I mean, we, we've had a great time. <laughs> um, so, you know. Well, there's a honeymoon period. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, please start spending, please start spending the money. Yeah. Right. Um, we don't let you spend too much. <laughs> yeah. This guy right here, we, you want him on your committee. <laughs> but, but, you know, we... <laughs> Yeah, I won't have to go um, Look, it'll be 18 years from now, we'll still have $15 million to spend. So, but yes, we, we do okay. want, we do, I mean, we do want your input. I mean, we, we realize that it's, you know, it's a shared aspiration and goal, and mm -hmm. so. I know it's early, but, yes. before as but, well. but do you have a, a time period where you expect to start receiving grants, roughly speaking? Um, so we have a grant, so we have grant awards every year, and so we are not stopping that process. So. The grant period will come up again. We are working feverishly um, to figure out the timeline for our structured um, application process. So that is literally what this next two weeks we're, we're trying to figure out what that timeline will be for letter and intent versus full application and everything like that. So I guess what I'm It will be in 2020. The next award period will be in 2025. That's what I was getting. Letter of intent. Y'all don't tell me this, because Janus will kill me. Um, <laughs> but we're, we're looking at like intent, letter of intent, winter, spring of 2025, like that January, third quarter, and then, you know, final awardees will, will need to be, you know, April, May, June, because it'll it'll coincide with the next July fiscal year. Fiscal year. Do, does the DOJ and all those other agencies have a deadline for the payout for every year? They do not. Uh, 
Yes and no. They have a deadline in the sense that yes, if you if you grant awards, then yes, there is a timeline that we then have to report to the DOJ. Um, but no, they don't say your awards have to be given out by this date. But <coughs> we've kind of set a trend, and so we're kind of stuck now with the annual trend in dates because we our municipal meetings have to kind of be 365 days from the last one. So you kind of start that yearly trend. Because what I was really kind of getting at is if you get so much money every year, if you don't pay it out, do you lose it? Or does no. It no, 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 no. It's the best okay. savings account you can have. Okay, great. That's all well, I hear. And honestly, um, that's that one, uh, Councilman Robinson. That is why we have not been too eager mm -hmm. to spend the money at this point in time because we wanted to make sure that we got it right. Yeah. That we actually had it planned instead of going out there and wasting dollars that were not going to be efficiently used in the future. And with it being a reimbursement process, any awardees that let's say, for whatever reason, just could not expend their money um, for whatever reason, you know, that all that stays in the bank Thank and you. just rolls to the next one. Thank so, you, I, and I got some concern about our small, smaller organizations, our grassroots uh -huh. organizations who don't have 500,000, um, nevertheless a million, how would we assist so, them? And we don't have 500,000 or a million to give. No. It, okay. it, when you put it in perspective of we only have three point, we've only been given 3.9 total. Uh -huh. So really, we're, you know, when you look at the grant awards, um, most of our grant awards are around 50,000. 50, 50, okay, okay. So, you know, they're looking at now. can we supplement? Most of our grant awards are supplementing what they're already doing. They're not funding the entirety of what they're already doing. It's supplementing what they're already doing. I'm, okay. I'll I also say it. that there's there's a whole spectrum of uses for the funding and mm -hmm. just like you never put all your investments in the in the one investment model, you want to try to diversify the initiatives that you're funding. Mm -hmm. So it, there will be a, a, a spectrum of how the dollars are uh, put out into the community. So we make sure that we're coming at it from all angles, just not yes. uh, a reactive response, yes. if you would, but being proactive as well. And we don't want to continue to fund something that is already being funded by another organization. So for example, if there's another large multi-million organization that let's say is funding hundreds of thousands of dollars into let's say one of the 12 um, opportunities then that's great let them continue to do that and let's let's see where our monies need to go mm -hmm. to if the stakeholders say there's a gap and we need to really focus on that gap then let's see how we can focus on that gap it may not be individual grantees like the, the centralized portal came up in our stakeholders meeting I thought it was a really great um, conversation. It may not be that we need to fund individual stakeholders for a portal. It may be a city county collaboration that that fund supports, but it benefits all the stakeholders. So again, I think there's some really good work that can be done um, and the stakeholders and their thinking outside the box and everything I think is what's going to lead <coughs> their boots on the ground and they know what's happening inside the community. Thank you. Right. No, I think we're good. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you, Mayor. The next item on the agenda is the Title VI non discrimination overview. I'll now call forward our Director of Human Resources, Leah Futrell, and Training and Development Specialist, uh, Jessica Carter, for the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, to, you, to you all Jessica Carter. She is our Training and Development Manager. Um, which is a position within our HR department. Um, in her role as Training and Development Manager, Jessica has also been tapped to serve as the Title VI uh, Coordinator. So she's going to spend a few minutes this afternoon providing you an overview of the Title VI non-discrimination program and sort of our next steps with regard to that. So I'll turn it over to Jessica. Nice to meet you guys. So we'll go ahead and get started. So what is Title VI? 
Title VI, federal law, <laughs> Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, no person in the United States shall be discriminated against based on race, color, or national origin under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance, and no person does mean uh, and encompass non-citizens. They're still covered, uh, and they do not have to be a citizen to be covered under this law. Civil Rights Restoration Act of 1987, no discrimination across all City of Greenville programs and activities, whether federally assisted, state funded, or locally funded. Um, so we uh, receive federal financial assistance from multiple uh, sources, USDOT, uh, HUD, NCDOT, Homeland Security for our police and fire rescue. Um, so it doesn't matter if they're federally funded or not, uh, Title VI is gonna protect that. Uh, retaliation, a quick way just to remember that uh, internal retaliation titles or internal is Title VII and then external is Title VI for protection. All right, the laws versus the program. So the law, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, covers race, color, national origin. The non-discrimination program that we're proposing for Title VI uh, covers race, color, national origin, specifically limited English proficiency. So these are individuals who have limited ability to read, speak, write, or understand English less than very well. Um, and uh, the city's going to provide reasonable steps to ensure the meaningful access to our services. Uh, and that includes interpretation and translation. Um, we're going to partner with Accolade. Uh, that's the contracted language service provider that the city is going to utilize um, to make sure that the translation and interpretation services are um, readily available to support our um, community members. And then regular evaluation of the language assistance measure to update. So if there's another language that we need to include in that, we're going to have constant contact with that contract and make sure that everyone's supported like they need to be supported. Uh, disability, gender, and age. Uh, low income and minorities. This touches on the environmental justice piece. Uh, we want to make sure that the fair treatment and meaningful involvement for all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of all environmental laws, regulations, and policies. So we want to make sure our citizens are heard. Uh, we want to make sure that they're involved in the decision-making process. And um, we want to make sure that we're determining solutions to overcome and remediate some disproportionate impacts. Um, in administering uh, this Title VI program, um, we have to be careful with our programs and activities, and the city's got to carefully assess to identify and avoid such impacts. So we want to make sure that we're proposing measures to avoid or minimize the impact, the negative impact. Um, and where permitted by law, we're going to provide offsetting benefits and opportunities to enhance those communities and individuals for our programs, activities, and policies. And then we need to consider alternatives to proposed programs if it is impacting them. What is discrimination? So intentional, an act or action. Uh, it could be intentional or unintentional, which a person in the United States, solely because of race, color, religion, gender, or national origin, has been subjected to unequal treatment under any program or activity receiving financial assistance. So an example of that would be, uh, we can't mandate that a person must speak English to sit on a city board or a city committee. Um, we can't prohibit wheelchairs on a city bus. Uh, disparate treatment or impact when a seemingly neutral policy, so it, uh, it, it looks neutral on its face, um, but it has the effect of disproportionately excluding or affecting in a negative manner and the practice lacks legitimate justification. So this could be something, a policy that we wrote, um, maybe we, we can't uh, have a policy prohibiting an accompanying person if a participant requires an aid to participate in the program the city is offering. All right, role of the Title VI program. We gotta develop and administer the City of Greenville's Title VI programs and policies, um, prepare and submit Title VI implement implementation plans where necessary, um, implement the city's complaints process, investigate and resolve claims of discrimination, review and assist in the development of the city's program directives so to ensure Title VI requirements are included, provide education, public notice and technical assistance to the city department, sub-recipients, contractors, and the public. Uh, submit reports to federal and state oversight agencies where necessary and ensure the city, the sub-recipients, and the contractors are all complying with this federal non-discrimination requirement. Compliance reviews, corrective action, and sanctions. Um, so we want to make sure that the contractual language is non-negotiable. We have to have that Title VI contractual language in all the things. Uh, sub-recipients, um, we pass a lot of money through to them. We give grants for organizations to run programs in the community, local businesses, things like that. So we got to make sure that they're upholding all this Title VI stuff as well. Local government requirements, designation of a Title VI coordinator, me. 
Uh, Title VI non-discrimination statement notice. Title VI assurances and contract documents and agreements. Uh, distribution of Title VI information community involvement plan. Training, complaint process and log, and then data collection and analysis. So the city has identified liaisons for each department. So every department within the city, there's 13, there's identified uh, liaisons. Those designated liaisons, they're going to coordinate with me, um, and we have easy access to the city manager. Um, the liaisons are going to document the complaints. Um, they're going to work with me on distributing and collecting non-discrimination complaint forms, um, initiating and monitoring the Title VI activities and assist with preparing required reports, investigation, and then develop the Title VI information for dissemination, posting notices in public areas. All right. Title VI non-discrimination policy statement signed by the city manager. They're going to be disseminated to the public by posting in very conspicuous areas. So facility bulletin boards, city website, public transit, libraries, um, city-owned facilities, recreation and parks, buildings and facilities. Um, spot checks will be um, performed to make sure that these notices are posted. And then there's going to be two copies um, for the liaisons to post in these areas, uh, one in English and one in Spanish. Um, Title VI non-discrimination notice. Provide notice of rights disseminated to the public by posting in very conspicuous areas and again all those places that I just mentioned. Alright, Title VI training. All employees are going to receive Title VI training. Uh, the first opportunity is during onboarding. So when they come in, new hires, uh, they're being onboarded as city agreed employees, they're going to go ahead and get that training right off the bat. Um, and the city of Greenville, we're going to train our uh, employees annually. Um, it's going to coincide right in, um, it's going to fall in place right with the other compliance EEO uh, trainings that we do every year. Uh, Title VI coordinator will maintain a record of training for all employees. Audit purposes, if they ask who's been trained, we're going to be able to have that documentation for them um, easily. Uh, In-person training is going to start out with the department heads and then we're going to go to the department liaisons. Um, uh, some of the departments, the, some of our employees don't have access to city emails, so there's going to be uh, in-person uh, trainings for that as well to make sure that they get trained as well. All right. Thank you. Any questions? Great job. I will, I will, I will say that um, when it comes to Title VI, you know, not, the reason we do this is not only just because it's the law, it's the right thing to do, but ultimately, we have a fiscal um, responsibility with all the dollars we receive, state, local, federal dollars that are tied to these, the, to the, the federal non-discrimination law. Our auditors on an annual basis will be seeking to make sure that we've got these procedures in place, that we got this correspondence and training out to our employees. And most importantly, in the review of all of our contracts with our sub, our contracts, our subcontracts, our subrecipients, that we've also got procedures in place to make sure that we are not discriminating in any of the way that we treat our community or the individuals that we do business with. So all of our, practically all of our funding is tied uh, to make sure that we're in compliance with, with the federal law. Very nice to say. All right, so <coughs> next item on the agenda, item number three. We have an update on the Unified Development Ordinance Project. I'll now call forward our Director of Planning, Les Everett, for the introduction of our speaker. Good afternoon. Uh, we've hit a major milestone with our UDO, our Unified Development Ordinance. We've had the privilege of speaking with the community uh, and working with them and, and getting feedback. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Ms. Sarah Sinatra. She's with Inspire, our consultant, and she's going to be giving you the update. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Sarah you. Sinatra with Inspire. Um, this has been a really exciting project. and. Um, you know, when we initially kicked it off, which was um, in the spring, um, the focus for the first few months was really gearing up for the amount of public engagement. Um, going through the, uh, the full ordinance to understand sections that needed to be potentially modified, looking at the horizons plan to, making sure, to make sure that there was um, consistency. So we've done a lot of basically homework in that time period. Um, and then we had um, some great opportunities to meet with the public. Um, so I just wanted to quickly go through um, in this presentation just where we are in the process. The overview of public engagement, and it's just going to be a very um, high level overview, you will be getting some further documentation that really breaks down kind of where the public um, had the most interest and where there was some um, specific feedback. We've actually categorized them, um, all the feedback we've received, so we can 
be able to respond to some of that. Um, talk about the task force. Um, we've had a really productive task force um, and they've given us great input and feedback and we have a few more meetings. I want to touch base on that and then of course question and answer. So just to quickly uh, run through the real goals of the project. Um, initially the focus was on authentic public involvement. Um, and I'll run through some of the um, meetings that were held and it meant having a lot of options for people to attend virtually, um, come to uh, in-person workshops, uh, uh, open houses, and be able to provide great um, feedback on surveys. Um, keeping our website current um, with uh, information that they can be able to find, to contact us and so forth, and we have been contacted by people as well. Um, and to ultimately provide an, a unified development ordinance that is actually very user friendly um, and clear and consistent for all users, whether it's um, the general public who wants to understand what, their prop, what they can do with their property or what their neighbor could actually build on the property next to them, or if, a, um, if someone's coming into town and wants to know where they could um, locate some sort of business, to be able to have a really um, user friendly document. Um, the overall scope was to update and modernize the ordinance. It's not to start over. You know, it's really to understand almost a report card initially. Um, is, do, are there ordinance changes that are needed? Um, and then to bring that into conformance with um, the Horizons plan. And so when we talk about what a UDO is, um, it is these things. It is subdivision regulations zoning and conditional zoning, lighting, signage, development review, and vegetation and, and buffer yards. So um, just to hit on a few of them, um, we had a lot of um, feedback and the public came and talked quite a bit about things like um, um, landscape standards. So I put that up there because I just want to point out vegetation and buffer yards is one of the topics for new construction. So there's, there's a lot of um, there's been a lot of question um, about what portions a UDO controls. It's, it's talking about new development, and that is something we are evaluating. Development review procedures. Um, whenever you look at any, any code, when you open it up and start looking at it, and um, when you look at the development re review procedures, it can be really complicated for folks to understand the sequencing of when a, an application gets submitted, what happens, what boards they have to go. So we are um, simplifying that process just so that it's easier to understand as well. Um, sign codes are very challenging because there is so much in there we need to be consistent federally with, but it's also really difficult for interpretation. Um, even experienced planners look at a code and, and have trouble trying to identify how you determine that size of a sign, and that shouldn't be the case. So what we're doing is um, making it just easier from uh, with graphics, having really good graphics embedded in that section, and in, in, in a lot of different sections, but particularly to sections that um, are a little bit more complicated, where they don't need to be overly complicated. Um, so we're showing how you determine the measurement of the sign, um, so that there, it, it takes out the gray area. Um, on the zoning and conditional zoning, I want to point out that um, the, the main, one of the main focus that we're doing is taking, the, you had a, a, a lot of uses, there are tons and tons of uses, um, but within those uses, a lot of them um, were either very, uh, were either the same, um, there was conflicting, so we are going and um, simplifying that entire uh, um, uh, use table um, into more simplified uses, and then every single use has a definition. Um, a lot of those definitions will also have graphics. So what that means is that when you're, when someone's trying to, to understand like what their front setback means or front yard or side yard, whatever, whatever's in that, we're going to have pictures. So when you go to the definition and you see you know, how it's defined and it explains that it means if it's on this road and this, and then it's going to have a picture that actually explains what that means. So it becomes easier for interpretation on all levels. So where we are right now, and this is why it was um, great that I was in, invited to chat at this point, um, uh, um, because we completed uh, all the public engagement, um, and so now we're really getting heavy into drafting of the, um, of the ordinance. We've completed seven open houses. Um, we've uploaded the data to the project website. Um, we've completed the comprehensive plan matrix, uh, creating action items um, for the proposed code updates. We've also um, proposed reorganization of code chapters. What that means is that, well, we've gone and we've taken all the chapters that are in the code and potentially reorganized them so it flows a lot easier. 
Um, however, that matrix is also part of the public information. So um, if anyone ever had a question about um, where, where it was previously, it's all memorialized. Um, we, again, developed new tables and updated definitions. Um, again, with the tables, we found it that when we looked at the sign code, it was all text. And that was very challenging, so we put that all into a table. And so anybody can understand how to, um, how to interpret what, what signage is required. Um, what we are doing now is integrating any of the red line code uh, changes from staff review. What that means is that um, there are a lot of questions when you, when you look at, um, when, when you have your, your code that your staff has been interpreting and people have had questions on it, they typically flag those and say, you know, this is an area of the code that potentially needs some reworking. So we're, we're looking through those red line um, changes now. <coughs> we're also finalizing summary and da the data following the public engagement. Like I was mentioning, there was, and I'll, I'll go through it in a moment, the amount of public engagement we received. We received a lot of surveys. Um, and so what we're doing is categorizing all of that into specific topics. Um, and potentially, who is the, um, the, the um, responsible party for those? Not all of what the, the feedback we received is, is housed within the Unified Development Ordinance. Um, but that was really good data that we received. It may be data that you're going to use for potential other uh, projects. Um, it may be something that is part of your next comprehensive plan project or something like that. So we want to be able to take all of that and um, assign it to the appropriate um, party for that. And then also, um, we are drafting standards for review and input at the next task force meeting. The next task force meeting is scheduled for November 6th. Um, there are five topics that we are going to present to them as very, um, um, uh, that are like critical topics that we want to get their specific feedback on before we incorporate any of those into the, um, into the draft code. So um, from the public engagement standpoint, like I mentioned, um, we have task force meetings. We had seven open houses. Um, we have an active website. And then um, I wanted to also mention there's a lot of events that, that, the, that your staff has attended also that were at um, your, your general events that you've had throughout the community. Um, that has been really, really well um, received and attended. We've got a lot of feedback from those events. So I thought that was really, really important. Um, and, and we're going to be showing um, some of that information as well as, as part of the website update. Um, for the task force meetings, we've held two. Um, we have uh, two more remaining. The November 6th meeting is the, the five topics I mentioned. The next was, is going to be sometime in January. We're going to set that date. That's going to actually be for them to review a potential draft of the document. Um, and then um, for the next task force meeting, we have these five topics. Um, these came out of the, um, a, a lot of the feedback that we received um, through the entire public engagement process. There was a lot of question about options for housing. Um, whether that means accessory dwelling units, whether that means a style of housing called cottage courts. These are things that um, we, are, uh, we, we are going to have um, language for the task force to respond to, but also a presentation. And it's supposed to be an interactive discussion about giving guidance on how to craft the, the next step of the language to help us um, finalize the ordinance. Um, signage. Digital signage, contract neutral signage, the types of signage. Um, it is uh, something that we really want them to react to and give us feedback on. Um, also, th this is uh, in conjunction with lighting. So we're putting the signage and lighting standards together. Um, vegetation standards. Um, we uh, are proposing to have a good discussion. We'd like to have a good discussion about um, potential vegetation requirements and standards and modifications um, on the, uh, for any new development. Um, home occupation. Um, we, are, we are including the Village of the Arts uh, concept as a discussion topic for them. Um, but home occupations in general have become um, uh, have really taken an interesting turn, um, really post-COVID. So we wanted the board, or the, uh, the task force, to give us some good feedback, and we'll have um, a, a, a good discussion with that. And then options for conditional zoning. Um, we want to introduce the concept to them, um, explain it, um, and look at options about um, where conditional zoning would be appropriate. 
Um, just a recap, these were the seven open houses. Um, we had the interactive activities. Um, these um, events were the events that uh, were held by city staff and, and we received a lot of um, uh, the surveys back. I actually have I just received um, a whole stack of ones from, from the last event, so we'll be inputting that, uh, which was great. Um, online engagement. Every Monday we go in and, uh, and look at the website to see what the patterns and traffic has been to the website and we report back to staff um, on the metrics of um, how many views, how many visits and contributions. Um, so far, over the seven open houses, we had 101 attendees um, attend, uh, attendees uh, um, visit. Um, 411 surveys were completed. Um, we broke it down by the printed and online versions. Um, again, that's as of uh, that's as of the second <coughs> when we prepared this. So we've received more since then, and we'll continue to update that. Um, 41 participants in the online visioning activity, and 18 participants in the online gather activity. Um, and just a summary of what the common themes were uh, that residents emphasize the importance of pedestrian and cyclist transit unit users um, with, with future development of Greenville. Um, repeated uh, concern for environmental impacts um, of development on the city, particularly on uh, trees and forest density. Um, emphasize the need for affordable housing throughout the city, not only for existing residents, um, but young families and professionals who want to remain in the area. Many attendees felt accessory dwellings have a place in Greenville, but had concerns on where they'd be permitted. Um, there were topics like setbacks, accessory dwelling units, relation to the structure, and things like that. And also, uh, attendees noted lack of essential services north of the Tar River, like uh, pharmacies, grocery stores, health clinics. So this is, this is what came out of um, a lot of the public engagement. Um, feedback um, from all uh, venues and events um, are going to be evaluated. Like I mentioned, we're doing this large matrix. And like I said, there's a lot in there that may not be applicable to the scope of the UDO. And why we ask a lot of the questions is because if we're identifying that you know, there's a certain area that um, folks are saying, well, we're, you know, we would like to see certain uses. We like to look at the zoning then and say, is there something in the zoning that's hindering that? You know, that gives us that opportunity. So sometimes it's not clear, like why are we asking this if it may not be in this in you know exactly what's the gonna happen in the in the UDO. But it's the idea that um, it will uh, it'll allow us to further dis uh, discover where there could be some potential changes in the future. And also, uh, maybe there's another department or division that could really help support that. Um, and so that gives us the tool to be able to tell them. Um, and then uh, consolidated findings will be shared um, and, uh, and to the task force members as well. Um, just a couple more on the examples um, uh, for steps for public engagement. We're looking at potential sign ordinances um, and then um, things like this that would be for, for next steps um, would be uh, directed to public works um, if it was something about transit. So just to talk about the, uh, the schedule, Next UDO task force, like I said, was November 6th. Um, we're expecting January to have the final task force meeting when they're going to be reviewing a draft. Um, we're expecting the presentation to council to be somewhere towards the end of March, beginning of April. Um, and then a, I'm sorry, to the uh, planning board. And then a draft to council probably like in uh, end of May, beginning of, end of April, beginning of May. And then uh, potential public hearings would be in June and July. Awesome. I believe that is it. <laughs> Any questions? We can, we can, we can yeah. um, put this um, presentation on our, our website uh, for the public and awesome. on, the web, on the UDO website as well for the public to be able to view. Perfect. That would be a lot better than the crappy pictures. Um, I do have a question. Um, and thank you very much for that presentation. That was wonderful. Uh, and I want to uh, commend the, um, the team, including our staff and, and your team, that uh, coordinated the uh, open houses, they were extremely well done. They were very engaging and they really invited a lot of participation, so just my appreciation there. I have a question, I don't wanna to get too much in the weeds, and the context is that I've always, um, since I've been on council and studied public policy, have understood that spot zoning is not good. 
and I hear the term conditional zoning, and I'm, I'm wondering what is conditional zoning and how is it different than spot zoning? You know, the kind of the 30,000 foot view, if you can. Mm -hmm. um, so spot zoning is a term that people just typically use, and it really means from the like granular level, it's when you're, um, you're zoning a piece of prop property that's inconsistent with your comprehensive plan. So that's like the basic you know, um, description. So when you're talking about conditional zoning, um, the what, what we're saying is we're proposing potential conditional zoning, which would help um, almost provide like performance standards, meaning um, it would provide some um, some design controls, things like that, that typically wouldn't be in place. Um, it doesn't mean that we would, you'd also be able to limit the types of uses and things like that. So it wouldn't be that it would be something totally that you're not comfortable with because we would craft it um, that the language would be more consistent, if that makes sense. So it's sort of like how we have our zonings now and you have permitted uses that you need to get a permit for, you need to go to the board adjustment for. Right. It's sort of expanding that concept to allow I, more uses. I almost, I almost think it's a little bit more like like plan developments if you're familiar with like oh, plan. Like the, what do we call them, the, the, the PUDs? In our zoning, we have a very Sim it's, it's similar to that concept where mm -hmm. it's like you can kind of craft how it should basically look and feel. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but we're proposing not to have it that it's you know anything goes. That there's going to be controls, and so it's clear for the, for an applicant that comes in that here's the checklist of um, of what is allowed by the city. And, you know, and then it gives the, um, the council also the parameters of how they can review it based on like, okay, did they meet this, did they meet this, did they meet that. And that's typically going to be for larger developments that, that encompass a lot of different types of So there's, there's options. We can look at it with a, a limit like on acreage and what can be, you know, can be looked at as that. Um, we're, we're still kind of evaluating that. We're hoping to, that's part of one of the topics that we're bringing to the task force. So um, uh, one of my team members is going to be giving like a whole a, a dis, uh, presentation to the task force and really hoping for like an interactive discussion about items they'd like to see, you know, within the conditional zoning realm um, and, you know, uh, how they feel about it, kind of explaining it a little further because it's a newer concept and so we want to make sure that we're addressing it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I have one. Yes. Um, to help maintain the character of community, is there a, a way, and I know there's been some conversation about this, to um, increase distance between same type businesses yes, to be able to better manage? Mm -hmm. We've actually already been evaluating this, and we're looking at a, num a couple of the different uses to include um, distance separation. It is a tool that's used everywhere in zoning where and so there's lots of good examples that we can pull and say here's um, other communities uh, because a lot of times you want to be able to look at those other communities and say this is tried and tested um, and they've done that for certain uses that may be um, not appropriate to be so close together so yes we are absolutely looking at that and it will be included thank you like two ABC stores on 10th Street within like a quarter of a mile of each other that's just uh, every time I see those, it just blows me away. <clears throat> so something to, cons to consider is if, um, when, if we're looking at any of those type of uh, restrictions, it will be for anything new uh, coming in. It's not to, you know, unless, unless somebody moves out of that area. Yeah, we can push them down. Oh, come on. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I just, that, that, I, I, every time I see them, I'm like, you've got one right here, and then you turn the corner, and you got one right here. So, anyway, thank you. Any other questions? Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Mayor, that's all we have for the workshop. So oh, my gosh. Stop the city council meeting early, is that <laughs> Don't we have to um, an, uh, do public announcements about that kind of thing? Yeah. <laughs> like Start 30. the meeting early. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure NCGS says exactly this, that. This is the first time we've been in a workshop early in a long time. Very impressive. Really so follow suit with, the, with the city council. Right. Right. We are. Good presenters today, right? There you Good. go. That's right. Yeah, yep. That's all we got. Yeah. All right. We got a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All right. Motion is to make by Councilmember Willis, yeah. second by Councilmember <laughs> Robinson. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion passes by zero. We are adjourned.